this presentation hopefully starts well, <laughs> but it might not end so well. Um, <laughs> uh, my, my thinking here is still not re fully resolved, but it, it seems like a good space in which to test out something. Um, so the, the, I thought it would be helpful just to start with this uh, proposition of Rancière about the idea of a political work of art. And he, he, he talks about the, the dream of a suitable political work of art is in fact the dream of disrupting the relationship between the visible, the sayable, and the thinkable without having to use the terms of a message as a vehicle. As a matter of fact, political art cannot work in the simple form of a meaningful spectacle that would lead to an awareness of the state of the world. So uh, this is a, a kind of a critique of the idea of politics in art, which is familiar to anybody active in the art world. We, we, th this is a critique of the idea of art and politics that's, that circulated before Rancière. It's, it's one that's familiar. And, and typically, the way this would be rehearsed within kind of art world conversations would be the people complaining about overly didactic works of art, or works of art which, were, which sought to broadcast a message or to inform us of correct thinking about the world. Um, and essentially, what I'm going to, to talk about is the way in which Rancière has been mobilized within a recent debate in the art world that kind of goes over some of this familiar ground. Um, I, I approach this primarily as, as somebody who works as an educator, um, uh, a little bit as a researcher, and, and also as an artist. I'm not a philosopher. Um, I trained as an art historian, and I trained as an artist. Um, I'm engaged by philosophy the way in which anybody in the contemporary art system is, but I definitely do not have the relationship with the philosophical text that somebody working within the traditions of philosophy does. So, so uh, that is both a permission to, to, to work in a particular way, but it is, it is also, uh, uh, it, it means that often the way in which we, we, one approaches the text can, from the eyes of the formally trained philosopher, look either like a, a naive misstep or an irreverence or, or too quick. So it's just, it's one of the risks that you take when you, when you step into other people's territory. But um, uh, as an artist, I'm, I'm engaged in a number of different practices. Some of them are traditionally gallery-based, some of them collaborative. Um, and this is just something I did recently um, for just a, a small independent zine. And um, uh, the, the zine was taking, what, it, what is an exhibition? And uh, before that, I just put in these two pages. So the first one here, in rightful sovereignty of an economy of images, I give you an exhibition. Uh, and, and complementing that, the next page was a, a, a quote from a piece of art history, which says, the early salons of the French Royal Academy spawned broader participation in critical discourse by the general public, not only by providing an egalitarian site for the expression of personal opinions, but by theorizing the legitimacy of amateur response in a field previously limited to experts. Theorists of the period encouraged those with little or no technical experience in art to speak their minds about paintings in pursuit of taste and individual distinction. Paradoxically, pursuing critical autonomy and individuality in this way entailed the assimilation of consensus values and protocols. The Salons prefigured the modern ethic of aesthetic self-expression that channels the pursuit of individuality and personal distinction into social order and hierarchy. My, my interest in putting these two things together was in the context of a discussion about what is an <coughs> exhibition, was to point to something which is not, I don't think sufficiently understood, which is that the protocols of exhibition viewing and discursive production within the context of art are not a development of the last 30 or 40 years. 
they're not even a development of post-revolutionary France. They predate this. They go back at least to the 17th century. And, and what, what's important here is to recognize uh, an imperative to speak to what is shown. And in the process of speaking to and about what is shown, to thereby achieve a formation of the self as a rightful participant in, in the public domain. And, and just this relationship of exhibition, looking, speaking, and producing oneself as part of the, 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 the community, the, the public of those who, can, who are recognized as, as citizens, as people. And, and what I'm trying to underline by that is the particular social technology that has been embedded within the practices of exhibition and within the development of the whole <coughs> fine art system. And this is a, 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 a theme that is uh, kind of broadly explored by a, a range of thinkers on the left, but probably most prominently someone like Bourdieu. But um, uh, variations on this thinking have also been heavily influenced by Foucault. And I, I just, I suppose I'm flagging my own, my own kind of background there. So what I'm going to talk to is about the use and abuse of Rancière in the collaborative practice debate. And, and I'm going to structure it in terms of identifying what is this collaborative practice debate. I'm then going to identify who the key protagonists are and, and where the key points of exchange have been. And then I'm going to look at the way in which Rancière has been deployed in this debate. And then I'm going to suggest that this relays us back to a very long-standing tension between Rancière and Bourdieu. So before beginning that, I just wanted to take a detour into how I was introduced to Rancière myself. And it was through the work of this, uh, this is work by an artist called Glenn Lochran. And he was a doctoral researcher in Dublin that I, did, I worked with. And his uh, area of inquiry was in questions of I the event, this philosophical construct, and forms of education. And he became very engaged by Rancière and was you know, telling me all about it. And I was like, well, why, why is everybody reading Rancière? What is, what is the appeal to so many artists about reading Rancière? Now, um, Lachlan's practice was setting up these temporary experimental educational situations where uh, in this, for instance, He's working with a group of children in a, a rural setting. The children have been kind of expelled from the school system. They're kind of slightly, ex well, significantly excluded. And he sets up this school beginning with building the school with them. And uh, he enacts a pedagogy with them. And he, he draws his uh, framework by trying to operationalize some ideas from Rancière. And the particular idea that he seized upon was this idea that equality is not something that we work towards. We don't start and say, we're going to work together now to become equal, to achieve equality together. But we declare, we announce, we are equal. And now let us proceed to be equal. To, 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 so our activity now will verify that. And he was taking this as a thing to literally enact. So um, the, the, the line from, from Rancière that he was drawing upon is this, equality is fundamental and absent, always up to the initiative of individuals and groups who, set against ordinary, the ordinary course of events, take the risk of verifying their equality, of inventing individual and collective forms for its verification. Now, what is, what is really interesting about, what, what struck me as really interesting about this at the time was that traditionally the, the, the kinds of ideas that were made available to artists through their consumption of the kind of advanced critical left philosophical critical theory tradition was, was typically forms of negation. That, that, that the kinds of way you could operationalize something like Adorno or you could operationalize something like Derrida, tended to be in terms of a negation, a withholding, a, a, a thwarting of expectation. It, it always had this kind of edge of something that was asserting a no. Whereas this, 
had, had this kind of utopian uh, moment which said, now, now we begin here, we are equal. And, and this clearly, I, I began to understand what the appeal was. And um, of course, the, the, this, uh, this challenge that Rancière makes to all educators when he talks about the stultifying effect of what I am doing in this moment now, when I sit here and I explain to you and I tell you, and you remain quiet, and I produce. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm explaining, and so I'm asserting, you, you don't understand this, you won't understand this, you need me to explain it to you. And, and Rancière analyzes this, and you drawing upon this uh, until then obscure uh, French uh, educational theorist and practitioner, Yakito, he, he identifies the problem with that dynamic. And what artists like uh, Glenn Lochran and others were trying to do was to operationalize Rancière's thinking by setting up learning situations where the explanations of the master were not the, were not the engine of what happened. They were not the privileged point of production, but something else was enacted. Rancière's critique of this kind of the master who explains and thereby tells you that you do not understand and you could not understand on your own, but you need my explanation. Rancière's critique of that master is also his critique of Bourdieu. Bourdieu uh, had famously described in his analysis of the distribution of taste, he famously described the way in which patterns of aesthetic choice mapped onto patterns of social differentiation. And he kind of reversed, he reversed the idea of how taste works to categorize the world. Instead of taste being the exercise of our judgment on what, what categories different things belong to, in, in announcing our taste, we are trying to position ourselves. This is Bourdieu, very summarily and very crudely, this is Bourdieu's analysis, that taste is the, the, the process of marking off social difference very crudely put. And uh, against this, Rancière uh, did, not, did not denounce. He didn't say, OK, well, Bourdieu is wrong in mapping the relationships between patterns of taste and patterns of social differentiation. R what he's wrong in is in producing his discourse in the way he claims to be doing the work of equality by describing inequality. And Bourdieu, or Rancière says that Bourdieu's description of the mechanisms of inequality are not doing anything to bring equality into being. Instead, they are placing it at this endless remove. So we will endlessly produce an explanation of the dynamics of inequality, and that very production of the explanation of inequality does not bring us to equality, but simply perpetuates, endlessly places equality at an infinite distance. So, so uh, um, Rancière attacks Bourdieu as the sociologist king. So it's a very kind of pointed and aggressive uh, take on Bourdieu. And it's, uh, it's typically been interpreted as the critique that Rancière had made of his own teacher, Althusser, <coughs> that this is just another moment in that critique where Bourdieu is the target. And, and essentially, it's the, the, the privileging of a form of intellectual work that claims to describe the world, but, but does not adequately work to change the world. So another thing that strikes me about why Rancière has been so appealing is because of the way in which his work coincides with a general renewal of interest in aesthetics. So Rancière is not the only philosopher who's on the agenda when it comes to the question of aesthetics. Significantly, Badieu, in, in a, a contemporary, um, but also in a very different way, Deleuze. So there's a range of uh, contemporary or recent philosophers who have been uh, informing and shaping this re-engagement with the question of the aesthetic on the part of contemporary artists. But I think one of the most interesting things about Rancière is the way in which he comes up with a new way of dealing with the kind of overarching continuity of aesthetic theory and aesthetic culture that's kind of posited within the kind of 
general traditions of high culture that we participate in. So, so w w when we get our introduction to modernism in contemporary art education, we get it with a kind of sense in the background that there is this overarching history, you know, Plato, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, modernity, and us. Um, and uh, one of the things that Rancière gives is a way of accessing that overarching continuity, but also reshaping it. He, he, re, he remaps it in some way, and he actually makes it available in a much more manageable way, I think, than the typical way in which we've delivered it. It's usually this kind of very fuzzy version of this overarching history of the kind of Western tradition of high culture that we get in art education, and he gives us uh, a, a more easily manageable version of it, and one that we feel we can get our hands on. Um, I also think that he gives a new orientation within this long-standing debate of aesthetics and politics, that he doesn't just repeat familiar tropes. He, he, he introduces uh, quite new ideas, and, and the key one is the one that we identified on the very first day, which is this distribution of the sensible. Um, so I, I mentioned this by indicating that, for me, I was brought into an engagement with Rancière through the work of one of my students, and to the way in which the work was being already operationalized within our practices. And I think that's a very important dimension because we talked, uh, I think David mentioned on the second day, the significance of the fact that Rancière was directly engaging with contemporary works of art. But I think it's also significant that, that certain artists are trying to operationalize um, his, his work. And I think that's a very uh, interesting kind of dynamic because it's not one, uh, I think it's an interesting dynamic. Anyway, so the collaborative practice debate. So collaborative practice is but one term, and it's not it's perhaps not the most adequate term. It's just one term to describe a range of practices. Other terms that have been used are things like social practice, socially engaged art, community-based art, dialogical practices, literal, participatory, interventionist, new genre. These terms are not all exactly the same. They come from different, uh, different genealogies, they come from different contexts. New genre comes from an American context, particularly informed by changes in public uh, art policy. Uh, literal comes from a very particular network that's been active since the early 1990s. Um, but broadly, what these different terms have in common is they point to a range of practices that in some way are seeking to reposition the place of art making, both reposition it institutionally and reposition it in terms of the role of the artist or terror. So whether it's a question of um, dif making authorship diffuse within a, a community or whether it's a question of mobilizing work outside of the institutional circus of the mainstream art world, there's many different uh, ways in which there's an attempt to basically step away from the, the inherited kind of avant-garde model of the, the production of the artist's voice within a particular institutional circuit so that it, it negates a set of expectations that are established in the institutional circuit, but at the same time is depending on the institutional circuit for its own production. Um, the, another term that's often thrown in here is relational, drawing upon Burio's term from the 1990s, relational aesthetics. And I think that, that adds another kind of confusing layer to this. But for the moment, what, if we could just take it that um, collaborative practice and the social turn are terms that became widely current in the art world in the last decade or so. As, as a way of broadly pointing to a range of practices that in different ways try to reposition the, the nature of authorship within the artwork and also to reposition the relationship of spectatorship, viewership, audience, um, often invoking either notions of collaborative authorship or participation. And I guess I, you'd, you'd have to be You'd have to be asleep for the last decade in the art world not to have registered that this kind of conversation was happening in some way, shape, or form. Um, one of the things that has also been happening is there's been an attempt to read back different histories of this. 
And I, I think a significant thing is the attempt to read, for example, certain developments in uh, South American practices of the 60s and 70s, such as Artsika and Ligia Clark, to read them into this tradition of social practice. Um, but part of the stakes of the debate that's happening are contests over how we define the domain and how we historicize it. So the, the, it isn't that there's a straightforward account that someone can give you and say, well, this is the history of this domain of practice and this is the edges of it. It is a highly contested object, and that's the nature of the debate. Um, and I should also point out that there's something about the particular locus of these debates, because um, I'm going to focus on an article from the mid-2000s by Claire Bishop that appeared in Art Forum. And it's very notable, I think, that the currency of this debate in the art world was, was hugely intensified when the conversation started to happen on the pages of Art Forum. But actually, this debate in, in uh, an earlier form had already been happening in the early 90s. Um, and, uh, but it had been happening in less prestigious places. It had been happening a little bit off-center and a little bit below the radar of the mainstream art world. And I just think it's important to register the, the placing, the locus of certain debates. And, and it's something that I won't <coughs> get into in this short presentation, but just to register it, is that another significant issue is the question of the national context, the particular geographical location of, of these issues. So um, uh, the, these, the question of practices that seek to renegotiate notions of authorship or to reconstruct the, the role of audience, spectator, participant, etc. these are not the exclusive prerogative of the developed Western world or whatever. This is something that has had a global distribution and arguably has emerged independently uh, in in different regions of different in, under different pressures and different problems. So it's not basically this is a diversified field. It should not be seen as a monolithic field of practice. Um, so with these caveats and recognizing that the the mapping of the differences between these practices is part of the stakes of the debate that I'm going to try to describe. Um, I'm going to take the, the art forum example and the Claire Bishop uh, article. The article was called The Social Turn, Collaboration and Its Discontents. Um, and she published the article in February 2006, and then in March, the next issue of Art Forum carried a, a response from Grant Kester. Um, and then the next issue, or actually in the same issue, there was a response from Bishop to, to, to him. So, so it was quite a quite discreet exchange, her article, his letter, and her response to his, to his letter. Um, and that has been the, the, the trigger, I think, for a much wider discussion within the art world. I think this debate, particularly in the North American context, needs to also be recognized as being a kind of a, an echo of an earlier debate that was happening in the 1990s and that particularly flared up around the 1993 Whitney Biennale, which, was, which has been called the Identity Politics Biennial. And, and basically, the reason I say there's an echo here, because at the heart of it is this, this question of the tension between works that seek to enact some kind, they have an orientation towards doing something within the life world, within the world of the everyday, within the social political terrain of, of the everyday. Um, and at the same time, they seek to operate within some explicitly avowed art context. And the question that, that it hinges on is, what happens to the artfulness, to the artliness of um, practices when they simultaneously wish to be effective within some other register, we'll call it the everyday, or we'll call it the social. Um, so it, there is a continuity with that earlier debate, which I think is important. Um, and I also think there's something different coming into play, and I, I hope to tease that out a little bit. So that's the, 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 the collaborative practice debate is essentially this particular moment of debate between Kester and Bishop 
played out on the pages of Art Forum and supplemented them with a number of exchanges in books. And just to that put some context on the protagonist. So Claire <coughs> Bishop, professor at the Graduate Center in Cooney, New York, um, and she'd originally come from the UK. She did her PhD on installation art and taught in Warwick and in the RCA and then moved to New York. Kester, also a professor of art history, um, based in the West Coast in San Diego, University of California. In the 90s, he'd been based in New York, upstate in Rochester, and he was the editor of the journal After Image. Um, and he had done his doctorate on the subject of 18th century um, English, British aesthetic theory. Um, so they're, they're both kind of reasonably high profile academics, both working in higher in the university and working in the general area of art theory that they would have as students both artists and art historians. Um, so they're, they're, they're in roughly the same kinds of world. Um, Kester published a book in 2004 called Conversation Pieces, which is a kind of a, a broad statement declaring this <coughs> field of practice that he calls dialogical art practices which he defines uh, through a critique of conventional ideas of the avant-garde and notions of critical art practice. So he, he sets up uh, his model of dialogical practice in opposition to certain ideas of the avant-garde and the, uh, the idea of the kind of shock, aesthetic shock tactics of the avant-garde. He, he critiques this model and announces this other model of dialogical practice. Bishop. Um, enters the fray when she does this, you know, the Whitechapel series of books, these anthologies of readings, and she did one on participation. And um, if I remember correctly, she didn't quote Kester in it, and that, that's quite a, you know, that's already a little bit pointed, because he definitely was probably the most prominent critical voice within this particular field for some time. Uh, through After Image, he had developed a very sustained uh, debate on the questions of these alternative arts practices. Um, then Kester in 2011 published the one and the many contemporary collaborative art in a global context, um, which is uh, significantly shaped as being a critical response to the argument um, that had developed with Bishop. And then Bishop delivered her volume, Artificial Hells, participatory art and the politics of spectatorship. So the, 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 the argument has played out in those books, um, but the, the primary focus of it has been a series of journal contributions that I mentioned. And just one other is Liam Gillick, um, because as well as publishing in Art Forum, Bishop published a version of her argument in the journal October. And that in itself is quite interesting, because I don't, if, you, if you know the history, Art Forum set up as um, the kind of artist journal um, became very kind of hooked into the commercial art system carrying a lot of advertising. Some critics involved with it stepped away from Art Forum to set up October, which is black and white, no glossy pages and no advertisements for commercial galleries. So there was a kind of the October announcing itself as a space of real criticism because Art Forum had become com too contaminated by the market. But um, in the, so in the 2000s, to have the same person writing across October and our forum and basically producing pretty much a similar argument is already an interesting kind of um, development. But then in response to her article in October, the artist Liam Gillick intervened. Now, I'm not going to pursue Gillick's intervention, but I just wanted to flag that the, I'm, I'm really taking one axis of what is a much more diffuse and varied debate, but in order to focus in on Rancière, this, is, this seemed to be the best way to do it. So here is the article that kicked it all off, really, the, the February 2006 Social Turn, Collaboration and Discontents. Can I just check, how many of you have come across this before? I just want to get a sense of... Have you come across this article before? Have you? Yeah, yeah. Because it's, it's the number, if you go searching for it online, the number of places that host it is quite remarkable. There's thousands of sources of this article online. So it's, 
I think it's probably one of the most reproduced articles out of our forum from the last 10 years. Anyway, in this, uh, Bishop opens with this list of examples of different art practices that in some way she's, she's capturing under this heading of the social turn. Um, she then turns to one particular project. I'll come back to some of her examples, but she turns to this particular project, Oda Proyeshi. Do, do anybody know? It's a Turkish collective based in Istanbul, and their work had evolved around setting up a three-room three apartment and using it as the basis of a series of activities to engage a local community and basically create a kind of cultural scene within a very specifically defined constituency uh, with the, the, the residents within an apartment block. Uh, but what, what Bishop refers to is her interview with these people where um, she claims here, here is an example where clearly aesthetic judgments have been overtaken by ethical criteria so that these people are evaluating their work not with reference to aesthetic questions, not re with reference to questions of their artfulness, uh, but with reference to the question of their ethical effect because of this, this kind of obligation to do good or something within the context of the, 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 the kind of social life of this particular community. Um, and she focuses in on the fact that they even said that the word aesthetic is a dangerous word. So that's like, this to Bishop seems strange. Uh, it seemed to me a curious response. If the aesthetic is dangerous, isn't that all the more reason it should be interrogated? So there's clearly uh, a kind of, here, here's a really good case for Bishop's argument. She's saying, the problem is with much of this art, not all of it, much of it, questions of art have been thrown out and in their place, questions of ethics, questions of right behavior in place of uh, questions of the judgment of taste or something like that. She, she makes, in, in her book later, she makes a similarly sharp kind of criticism in respect of the community art tradition. Um, and it's important to read that the community art tradition is, is older, goes back at least to the 70s, um, and this is coming out of kind of left traditions of cultural democracy. It's a different trajectory from Oda Proyeski, uh, um, but she also talks about avoiding questions of artistic criteria. By avoiding these questions, the community arts movement unwittingly perpetuated the impression that it was full of good intentions and compassion, but ultimately not talented enough um, to be of broader interest. So that's, that's not sparing anybody's feelings. Now, uh, she says, the discursive criteria of socially engaged art at present draws from a tacit analogy between anti-capitalism and the Christian good soul. In this scheme, a self-sacrifice is triumphant. The artist should renounce authorial presence in favor of allowing participants to speak through him or her. This self-sacrifice is accompanied by the idea that art should extract itself from the useless domain of the aesthetic and be fused with social practice. So, so Bishop's concern is that it's, it's a collapse of the distinction between the uh, aesthetic and the social to the point where the aesthetic is excluded and all that's left is the social. But she's not trashing all of this domain. She's simply pointing to a tendency within the domain that she sees as very problematic, which is the displacement of questions of art in favor of questions of ethics. Among the examples that she holds out as good examples are Jer Jeremy Deller's Battle of Orgrave. Do you know this work? Uh, it, it's, it's a reconstruction of a very famous conflict in the miner strike captures Britain in the 1980s where uh, the miners and the police have this showdown. And it was seen as a kind of a, a, a turning point in the, the unfolding of the minor strike, which is seen as a turning point in the unfolding of contemporary Britain. Um, but what Della did was he brought together battle reenactors, people who would normally restage scenes from the 17th century Civil War, dress up in costumes and recreate particular maneuvers from these historical battles. But now they dress up as miners and as policemen to reenact this, uh, this scene. So one of the things that he's doing is saying this event in a piece of industrial action in a strike is part of the history 
of Britain, the way in which the Civil War was. And the piece was actually used the Civil War as part of its title. But I mean, this is an example that, that uh, Bishop holds out as kind of good uh, social practice because it doesn't collapse questions into social effectiveness. It also leaves in play a certain disruptive uh, aesthetic practice. The things happen here which are not simply about doing the right thing, but are about the artist pursuing his own, his own desires. Um, I'll go through a couple of the other examples that she cites just because the rest of my slideshow is text. So I'll show you some pictures if we can have them. Uh, Phil Collins and the, they shoot horses, don't they? This, do you know this work? It's um, uh, uh, Phil Collins, a winner of the Turner Prize, um, British artist, uh, now based in the States. And uh, this is a project where he worked with people in uh, Palestine and he got them to do a marathon dance upon to contemporary pop music. And uh, this, this work is again is held out as an example of a collaborative project um, where there isn't this kind of uh, what Bishop would see as a, a cloying over ethical concerns. I mean, is he exploiting the people who are shown in the video and so forth? So it's like, you know, it's not, it doesn't get preoccupied with those details and instead it's focused on constructing what is a kind of problematic and difficult and tricky proposition, but therein lies its artfulness. So it's, it's precisely because there is this kind of ambivalence, ethical ambivalence at work within it, that the work has interest and has, is compelling for a bishop. And then this is a piece by Arthur Zmiski. I don't know if there's any Polish speakers here can help you with that. But uh, uh, Arthur Zmiski, this is a piece that he presented in Documented 12. And here it's a video documenting a process whereby four sets of people from Poland who represent different ideological positions, um, the socialist youth, the, the Catholic Nationalist Party, and stuff like that. So they're brought together in this project where they're making, Im making a painting, four paintings together, and then at a certain point they're asked to do work on each other's paintings. So somebody's been making you know, paintings with lots of Polish national insignia, someone else is making paintings showing good socialist youth and progressive ideas. And then uh, the, as they move to work on each other's paintings, they, they eventually go to war with each other and, and the, the dynamics of the groups kind of b unfold and we have this kind of uh, uh, agonistic exchange. So this is an example again that, um, that Bishop mobilizes. Now, part of what she is interested in this kind of work in, in terms of Bishop's position is that we're, we're brought to look at these people in a kind of voyeuristic way as they start to attack each other. And there is a kind of spectacularizing of their conflict for our entertainment. So in that sense, there's a, a kind of a, a, an unethical or ethically questionable kind of action on the part of the artist. But, but um, Bishop sees that as, in a sense, part of what makes this work interesting rather than something that is to be flattened and excluded from the work. So, um, and then other, other examples are Karsten Holler. This is a famous installation. I think this is the version from the Turbine Hall in, uh, in Tate. But you know, so as a viewer of this work, you climb up several flights and then you slide down through the tubes of the sculpture. So it's a kind of work that's activated by the engagement of the viewer participant. And then, of course, Santiago, Santiago Sierra, who was mentioned earlier in the week, and this is a very famous piece, workers who cannot be paid remunerated to remain inside cardboard boxes. So the exhibition consists of a series of cardboard boxes, and the proposition is that sitting inside the cardboard boxes are uh, paperless, uh, paperless migrants who cannot be paid for their work. So it's a... It, the work depends upon the direct exploitation of these vulnerable uh, people and, and it's put on display for the gratification of the viewer. So these works are very problematic, of course. They generate lots of debate. Some of the works have been censored and shut down. One work where the proposition was that he was building a, rep, a gas chamber in a synagogue. So that this was the proposition and the work created a huge media 
uh, controversy and, and the work did not proceed. But uh, Sierra, this is a quote from Sierra that's often used. I can't change anything. There's no possibility that we can change anything with artistic work. We do our work because we're making art and because we believe art should be something, something that follows reality. But I don't believe in the possibility of change. This is a quote that's taken up by Bishop. It's also, it's a quote that's been kind of argued about online because there's the suggestion that she might take it a little bit out of context and so forth. But I just wanted to indicate something of the flavor of the kinds of works that she mobilizes as examples of social practice where ethical questions are not allowed to take over, where there's still some other kind of agenda to do with art. And she sees that as what rescues these works from becoming examples of kind of dull, boring, uh, uh, uninteresting as art. Um, so what rescues is the fact that they don't become subdued by the ethical questions. So she, uh, I've mentioned her already, so just the, 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 inter the reason she picks out these works, she says, is intersubjective relations weren't an end in themselves, but rather served to unfold a more complex knot of concerns about pleasure, visibility, engagement, and the convention of social interaction. So uh, the best collaborative practice of the last 10 years addressed this contradictory pull between autonomy and social intervention and reflect on the antinomy, the tension between two principles, both in the structure of the work and in the conditions of perceptions. It is to this art, however uncomfortable, exploitive, or confusing it may first appear, that we must turn for an alternative to the well-intentioned homilies that today pass for critical discourse on social practice, on social collaboration, and now she puts the boot in on Kester, and, and she describes his earlier book, and says this adds up to a familiar summary of the intellectual trends inaugurated by identity politics, respect for the other, recognition of difference, protection of fundamental liberties, and an inflexible mode of political correctness. As such, it also constitutes a rejection of any art that might offend or trouble its audience. So she basically not only defends a particular mode of social practice, she launches a fairly full-on attack on a particular critical discourse in defense of a different mode of social practice as far as she's concerned. Um, and basically, Kester is lined up as a politically correct policeman who's, who's stopping uh, people from taking any kind of ethical risk. Here. So Kester responds saying, I was surprised to learn from Clara Bishop that politically engaged collaborative art practice constitute today's avant-garde. A more measured assessment might recognize a continuum of collaborative and relational practices ranging from the work of biennial circuit stalwarts like Rickwith, Tervanitia, Thomas Hirschhorn, and Santiago Sierra, to that of more overtly activist but less visible groups such as Alaplastica, Park Fiction, and Platform. So he, he, he's kind of hitting her on, okay, she's overstating the primacy or the level of visibility of this domain of practice, and she's kind of prioritizing the, the biennial friendly version of this practice and neglecting this kind of other other examples, which the, the examples he picks out are Park Fiction. Do you know this group? Um, Hamburg-based uh, initiative going back to the mid-90s where uh, an, a group of artists and local activists uh, worked to campaign against a gentrification scheme in this kind of uh, part of the harbor region of Hamburg, St. Pauli. And the, the, they developed this kind of agitation around people imagining an alternative way in which this part of the city might develop. And they, they did this thing about wishes for a park, and they actually ended up securing this uh, redesign of the urban space. But this is a, a project that unfolded over about 15 years. At one stage, it was represented within the document of 12. Um, so it had currency within the art world, but it also was deeply embedded within the local politics of Hamburg. Um, another group that uh, Kester picks out is Alaplastica, arts and environmental organization in Argentina, who've been operating since 91. I, 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 and then another example is this group platform, 
also operating since the early 90s, based in the UK, that do a lot of work internationally. They began working around this question of retrieving memory of, of buried rivers. So London, there's lots of tributaries of the Thames that have over centuries been buried, some of them have been turned into sewers or whatever. So part of their work, motivated by kind of ecological concerns and so forth, was to reanimate a memory of these hidden waterways and then to open up questions about the ecological dynamics of the city. So three different art practices, these are the ones that are cited by Kester as uh, being examples that aren't included in the discussion by Bishop, but he also claims that these practices need to be understood as much more complicated than simply examples of do-gooderism or something. Okay, so the, he, he argues the general discomfort of mainstream art critics and institutions with politically engaged art is long-standing. Consider Douglas Crimp's break with October in the early 1990s over his interest in AIDS activist groups. This discomfort is evident in Bishop's own essay. So what he's saying is that the problem is that real political action is a kind of phobic object for mainstream art criticism. And he points to this episode in the history of October where the critic, the critic and editor, uh, Douglas Crimp, became very active within the uh, uh, ACT UP AIDS activism of the late 80s, early 90s. And eventually, because of differences with the rest of the editorial collective, he kind of left October. And their criticism, roughly the argument was about the fact that the proper, <coughs> proper theoretically rigorous art criticism was being contaminated by getting too close to the rhetorics of activists. And there was a kind of a discomfort. But there is this amazing moment in 87 when this issue of the journal appeared on cultural analysis and cultural activism. So uh, Kester points to this and suggests that there's a kind of long-standing tension uh, and anxiety within the art system when it gets too close to actually live political contestations. Um, so he says, rather than a continuation of collaborative practice, Bishop seems determined to enforce a fixed and rigid boundary between aesthetic projects, provocative, uncomfortable, and multi-layered, and activist works, predictable, benevolent, and ineffectual. So he's, she, he's suggesting that Bishop is constructing a kind of a, a very uh, crisp binary between uh, good, aesthetic, provocative, challenging, etc., and bad, activist, predictable, benevolent, uh, ineffectual, uncomplicated. Um, for Bishop, art can become legitimately political only indirectly by exposing the limits and contradictions of political discourse itself. The violent exclusions implicit in democratic consensus, for example, from the quasi-detached perspective of the artist. In this view, artists who choose to work in alliance with specific collectives, social movements, or political struggles will inevitably be consigned to decorating floats for the annual May Day parade. Without the detachment and autonomy of conventional art to, to, to insulate them, they are doomed to represent in the most naive and facile manner possible a given political issue or constituency. So he, he's accusing her of overly simplifying by making this very crude opposition. She responds, <laughs> he finds in my essay what he wants to read rather than what I actually <laughs> say. His righteous aversion to authorship can only lead to the end of provocative art and thinking. So this is pretty, this is pretty hard stuff. I mean, she's, she's accusing him of bringing art to an end, and, and uh, he's accusing her of an overly simplistic analysis, but it's clearly a bit heated. He says, I believe in the continued value of disruption as a form of, or she says, I believe in the continued value of disruption as a form of resistance to instrumental rationality and as a source of transformation. Without artistic gestures that shuttle between sense and nonsense, that recalibrate our perception, that allow multiple interpretations, that factor the problem of documentation uh, into each project, and that have a life beyond an immediate social goal, we are left with pleasantly innocuous art that easily compensates for inadequate governmental policy. 
So you get a sense of the debate. And, and now, the question of how Ranciere plays in the debate. Bishop uh, draws heavily on Ranciere, and she, she, in that response to Kester, she says, the framework for my essay was Ranciere's articulation of the relationship between politics and aesthetics. In his schema, a political work of art disrupts the relationships between the visible, the sayable, and the thinkable without having to use terms of a message as a vehicle. It transmits meanings in the form of a rupture rather than simply giving us an awareness of the state of the world. Um, she further quotes him, suitable political art would ensure at one and the same time the production of a double effect, the readability of a political signification and a sensible or perceptual shock caused conversely by the uncanny, by that which resists signification. Um, according to this perspective, Bishop continues, we can no longer speak of old-fashioned autonomy versus radical engagement, since a dialectical pull between autonomy and heteronomy is itself constitutive of the aesthetic. Good art would therefore sustain this antinomy in the simultaneous impulse to preserve itself from instrumentality and to self-dissolve in social practice. So just, I, I think that's a fairly familiar kind of m model, the idea that you, you, hold, you hold these two contrary poles in play, you don't allow one of them to take complete dominance. So you don't allow questions of art to completely override questions of ethics, you don't allow questions of ethics to completely override questions of art. And you don't simply have a kind of sloppy compromise. You have tensions. You, you have a pull, a, a, a field of tension between these two principles. So I, I think it is interesting to note, as a first step, that Bishop, in reviews of her books, there have been the suggestion that she's not reading Rancière correctly. So um, one critic challenges that uh, her, her idea about aesthetic quality being left out of the community arts agenda, the critic says, such a judgment arguably reflects a refusal to see the social as aesthetic, an attitude that appears contradictory in the context of Rancière's calls for a radical a revision of aesthetics as con congruent with the social distribution of the sensible. So there's a suggestion that she, Bishop, reads Rancière wrong. Kester in his book when he takes a more detailed uh, uh, response to Bishop, he takes Rancière in his sights and says, uh, Rancière is an art world favorite because his work provides theoretical validation for an already cherished set of beliefs about the political function of the artwork. So he's saying that Rancière has found such popular currency because what he's saying seems to back up or to shore up a position that's already held within the art world. Kester cites the Emancipated Spectator essay, and, uh, and he quotes directly, uh, the crossing of boundaries and the confusion of roles shouldn't lead to a kind of hyper-theater turning spectatorship into activity by turning representation into presence. On the contrary, the theater should question its privileging of living presence. It calls for spectators who are active interpreters who render their own translation, who appropriate the story for themselves, and who ultimately make their own story out of it. An emancipated community is in fact a community of storytellers and translators. So uh, Kester cites this from Rancière, and then he glosses it as follows. He says, Rancière warns us against a too hasty inversion of the intellectual authority of the author or artist. Um, and we don't need to turn spectators into actors. We don't need to turn the ignorant into the learned. We don't just simply reverse things. And Kester glosses this as, determinant agency continues to rest with the master while the reader is allowed a compensatory form of emancipation by translating the author's text in his, own, in his or her terms. Rancière retains, so, so uh, Kester is now mobilizing the fact that uh, Rancière uses the tradition of aesthetics and particularly draws upon Schiller's letters on the aesthetic education of men. Um, so he says, Rancière retains key elements of Schiller's aesthetic education as the bringing to consciousness of the unenlightened by an advanced cadre of artists and poets, 
the deferral and displacement that is characteristic of the aesthetic is thus premised on a necessary gap between transformed consciousness and subsequent action. Enlightenment or emancipation must precede action in the world. So Kester is criticizing Lancier as part of a wider critique that he mobilizes about the development of critical uh, theory on the left post-68, um, but also in a way that echoes his criticism of Bishop. So uh, the, Kester is not simply attacking Lancier, he's attacking the whole currency of post-structuralism within art criticism as a kind of orthodoxy. So the orthodoxies of post-structuralism is, is part of his main target, and Rancière is, is one figure within that. And he also kind of, I think there's a, there's a risk that what he does is he kind of blurs Rancière into Bishop. And so uh, Kester argues that Rancière is working with the same kind of crude binary opposition or crude split of the field. And says, few, if any modern artists or movements ever advocated a complete withdrawal from the social or a total dissolution of art specificity. Um, so we could also argue that Kester misreads Ranciere and that in fact both Kester and Ranciere converge in declaring that the model of critical art practice that punctures the spectacle and kind of reveals or interrupts or shocks our, our false consciousness is inadequate. So we can say, well, maybe Kester is not reading Rancière properly, and in fact, we can identify a point of convergence between the two of them. So Kester says shock disruption uh, are accorded intrinsically liberatory power in the tradition of avant-garde art, um, but this, this should not be the case, that there's no, the, the, the actual forms of reception and effect set in motion by the experience of disruption or dislocation are considerably more complex and potentially ambivalent. So the idea of the avant-garde strategy of shock, of a disruption of our expectations, as necessarily leading to some form of emancipatory or liberatory potential is, uh, is criticized by Kester, and also it's criticized by Ranciere. I think very clearly he says, there's no reason why the sensory oddity produced by the clash of heterogeneous elements should bring about an understanding of the state of the world, and no reason either why understanding the state of the world should prompt a decision to change it. No direct road from intellectual awareness to political action. So there's, there's, a, there's maybe a convergence between Kester and Ranciere in criticizing a particular model of avant-garde shock tactics. Um, but Ranciere's conclusion to this essay, and this is the essay that we're going to be looking at together at the weekend, but um, in his conclusion to that essay, uh, Ranciere has this discussion of Pedro Costa's film in Vanda's room. And in this essay, I think he does precisely what Kester is accusing him of, which is, I in a way, establishing a master's voice. In this case, that the artist voice is given this kind of, uh, this particular role. Um, so this is uh, Ranciere speaking, he says, while relational artists are concerned with inventing some real or fancy monument or creating unexpected situations in order to generate new social relationships in the poor suburbs, Pedro Costa paradoxically focuses on the possibilities of life and art specific to the situation of misery. The patience with which he listens to the often trivial and repetitive words uttered in Vanda's room. So uh, Ranciere is talking about this Portuguese filmmaker's film in Vanda's room, and the film shows us a part of the suburb of Lisbon, where, and we have three junkies in a room, and they're, they're in the process of having to withdraw from that room because this part of the city is being demolished. And uh, rather than what Ranciere praises the film, saying that rather than give us an analysis of the causes of social exclusion and so forth, what happens is the film shows us something. It shows us something, um, and he p points particularly to a particular moment in the film where one of the junkies is scraping, cleaning away a table surface, while the others are saying to him, what, do, what, what are you wasting your time doing that for? We're, we, this is not your table, and we're not going to be staying here. Um, and Ranciere focuses in on the way in which uh, the filmmaker calls attention to this, uh, this, this seemingly trivial action 
of creating something, of making something, of some preoccupation on the part of the junkie doing this. Um, but what I want to focus on is in Rancière's description of the film, this line that he uses, the often trivial and repetitive words in Vanda's room. So this film shows us the junkie in the room talking, but their words are trivial. What they say, and, and these junkies remain nameless for Rancière, what they say is not heard by Rancière saying something important or notable, something meaningful, but the auteur's cinematic mobilization of their voice, this is saying something. So he, basically, Rancière is prepared to hear the filmmaker as speaking meaningfully. He, he is entered into saying something. But the, the speech of the junkies presented in the film is trivial. It's trivial until it's mobilized by the, the auteur. And I, I think Rancière risks enacting something he describes elsewhere, which is disagreement is not the conflict between one who says white and another who says black. It is the conflict between one who says white and another who also says white but does not understand the same thing by it. <laughs> An extreme form of disagreement where X cannot see the common object Y is presenting because X cannot comprehend that the sounds uttered by Y form words and chains of words similar to X's own. So the junkie speech is trivial. The auteur's matters and Rancière's matters. And I think the problem is that Rancière is enacting a moment of disagreement that he does not recognize as such. And I do not think this is a fatal problem. And I think what we have is we have a number of ways of reading Rancière. We have Bishop, who's an affirmative reading. This is what he is saying, or this is what it is saying, and I agree. We have an opposing reading where uh, Kester says, this is what he or it is saying, and um, I disagree. And those other people, they only agree because they already agreed before they read it. So it's, it's, in, it's suggesting an inauthentic uh, form of thinking. Then there's an inquisitive reading. The critic who says of Bishop, I, I don't think she's reading Rancière correctly. She is, that critic's in the position of saying, well, is that really what he says, or is that really what it says? And then you have the combative reading, which is what I risk doing there when I say, ha-ha, I've found a contradiction. There's a kind of, <laughs> first he says this, and then he says that, and he doesn't even agree with himself, okay? So th they're all kind of modes of reading Rancière that have been enacted so far in, in working through this debate. And, and there's, there's a question, if there's maybe another type of reading, which is a kind of recommended reading, or a requested reading, or a, a, a collaborative reading. So, please to read me in a particular way. So, or, or please to work with me in this way to, to read what I'm doing. And I think this is one of, the, one of the issues that we face in reading anybody seriously, is that we, we, we cannot simply stop with an affirmative reading or an oppositional reading or a combative reading. Or, uh, we, we need to have several of these moments, but we especially need to begin somewhere with this, with a, with a kind of willingness to work with the person we're reading. Um, so I think that, that in a couple of places, Rancière prompts us with how we should approach reading him. And, and I think we go back to this thing about the... the the spectator, where he says, the, the, we call for spectators who are active interpreters, who render their own translations, who appropriate the story for themselves, and who ultimately make their own story out of it. So I don't think he's out of the woods. I think that the, 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 the performative contradiction that I'm seeing in Rancière, I think, is one that he's calling me to by the way in which he's instructing me to approach reading him. Um, if we go to the ignorant schoolmaster, I think we also find a kind of corrective. We find this other thing where he says, reason begins where discourse is organized with the goal of being right, cease. Begins where equality is recognized and equality decreed by law of force, not a passively received equality, but an equality in act verified at each step by those martyrs who in their constant attention to themselves and in their endless revolving around the truth 
find the right sentences to make themselves understood by others. And so what, I, what I'm teasing at now is how we read Ranciere, having seen the way Ranciere is deployed within this particular debate and coming upon a number of kind of moments in how we might read. I'm looking at how he's cueing us to read and um, I, I'm pointing to a kind of, a, on the one hand, this, this saying, this promising that we have the ability to author translations and readings from his text as we so wish, aligned with our testing of our equality. Um, but we also have this other thing about not getting into a kind of a game of win rhetorics, a game of winning at any cost to, 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 to set up the goal of being right. I'm the right one, I have the right reading. Um, and I think that the, 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 what is necessary to do to cooperate with Ranciere is to accept that he's operating within a space of necessary contradiction, that, that his mode of disclosure is going to be, have these performance contradictions, have these paradoxes, and to see that not as a, a massive failing or a fatal problem in the, in the text, but to see it as a consequence of the kind of, the kind of thinking that he's trying to do. And I, in, in a uh, lecture that he gave on his ignorant schoolmaster thesis, uh, many years after he published the book, where, where he, re, he gives a reprise of the theory, he concludes the lecture with this, with this uh, statement, which I think indicates his own articulation of, of operating in paradox, or operating in a performative contradiction. He says, affirmative of these simple principles, that equality is fundamental and absent, in fact constitutes a dissonance one must, in a way, forget in order to continue improving schools, programs, and pedagogy, but that one must also, from time to time, listen to again so that the act of teaching does not lose sight of the paradoxes that give it meaning. So I, I think it's necessary for us to read Ranciere with these contradictions, to not ignore the contradictory moments, but to attend to them but not see them as necessarily fatal flaws within the articulation of his critical work. Um, but I, I do, I want to just finish, this is a very short bit and then I'll, I'll finish, but um, I do want to, to seize upon what I think is a very serious problem. And, I, um, and it's in the passage that ends this essay that, that I cited the discussion of the Portuguese film from Van der Groot. In the passage that ends the essay, Ranciere turns to the question of the social system, and he notes that Costa's film will be immediately labeled film festival material, something reserved for the exclusive enjoyment of a film buff elite and tendentiously pushed in the direction of museums and art lovers. So he, 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 at this moment, Ranciere turns to the, the political economy of the distribution of this work, the institutional circuits that it passes into. And um, I think here we have a small echo or trace of Bourdieu. This is, this is Ranciere acknowledging Bourdieu, a trace of it, um, the socio-analytical taste as the marking of social difference. So uh, reserved for the exclusive enjoyment of a film buff elite and tendentiously pushed in the direction of museums and art lovers. Who will go to see this film? It's, it's going to be distributed through art house and film festivals is, is what Ranciere points to. Um, Ranciere's critique of Bourdieu that he elaborated earlier in The Philosopher and His Poor and elsewhere. Uh, Rogers' critique of Bourdieu is that he establishes a master voice, the sociologist king, who describes the facts of inequality, but does not actually affect equality by doing so, but rather endlessly defers equality. What Kester challenges Ranciere on is similar. He, he thinks that Ranciere is engaged in the reinstatement of a master who pronounces on the conditions of equality a master who tells us what our emancipation is really. And again, the line, determinant agency continues to rest with the master while the reader is allowed a compensatory form of emancipation by translating the author's text in his or her terms. And I think that Kester's, I, don't, I think Kester's uh, criticism is not always correct. 
but I think in that particular case of the way Rancière reads in Van der Zwoon, I think he is correct. And I think it's very notable in Rancière's text that as he talks about the film, when he reaches that point, he shifts to another film and he talks about the, um, the music the, uh, from another of the films in the series. There's a kind of an interruption in the development of his analysis of the piece, and it just, he cuts it off and moves, he displaces onto talking about another film. And I think, I think Kester has hit upon a point in Rancière's work where there is a problem. Um, Freud, we have this reference to civilization and its discontent. And one of the ideas that Freud uses there is an idea from anthropology called uh, the narcissism of minor, or the narcissism of small differences. So this is, this is where I have somebody here very close to me, and I put a lot of attention into those minor differences that make us very, very different. So the, 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 the narcissism of small differences. And I think that Rancière and his relationship were with Bourdieu, I think Rancière is enacting a kind of narcissism of small differences. Both are working with the same problematic, which is the question of the aesthetic and the role of the tradition of auteur culture, of independent, the, the, the whole tradition of the independent art, artist, the auteur, the one who has control of their labor as an artist, decides what they will work on, when they will work on it, how it will be worked on, how it will be, because that kind of model of labor within the idea of auteur culture. Um, they both share the problem of t knowing what to do with this within the tradition of left intellectual and political work. And um, Bourdieu, what Bourdieu does is he, he, he says, I am going to uh, do a bad thing here. I'm going to desacralize the art thing. I'm going to say, you, your choice in taste of haircuts and your ideas about a good painting and the places you go to find pleasure, we're going to put them all together as objects of analysis for the sociologists. And um, he, he, he says, the barbarous reintegration of aesthetic consumption into the world of ordinary consumption abolishes the opposition which has been the basis of high aesthetics since Kant, between the taste of sense and the taste of reflection and between facile pleasure and pleasure reduced to a pleasure of the senses, between that pleasure and uh, pure pleasure, pleasure purified of pleasure, which is predisposed to become a symbol of moral excellence and a measure of the capacity for sublimation which defines the truly human man. So Bourdieu's analysis of the aesthetic is to just basically grab it and pull it into the social and say, this is ideological work, and that's how it has to be apprehended. And um, what, what Rancière is doing with his idea of the aesthetic regime is he falls on, on the side of not directly disagreeing with Bourdieu. He doesn't say that Bourdieu is wrong to map the way in which aesthetic culture operates within the construction of social distinction, um, but he holds out that um, the separation of what he calls formatted culture, where the audience is formatted, the product is formatted, the circumstance of consumption is formatted, and the experiences are completely formatted. He holds against that the possibility that artworks can rework the frame of our perceptions and the dynamism of our effects. I think both of them are caught in a particular problematic which is about recognizing that the elaboration of our ideas of the aesthetic is part of the elaboration of bourgeois modernity. But these categories have to be grappled with, have a particular significance within the tradition of the left. And Bourdieu's solution is to dissolve it into the question of the social. And Rancière's position is to hold out that yes, there is this working of, of aesthetic culture within the social system, but there is also a je ne sais quoi. He's also holding out for there is something else. There is another thing. Um, and I think what both of them fail to do is to uh, engage the question of how aesthetics might have emerged otherwise.
then as a philosophical discourse that prioritizes the question of art over the question of aesthesis. That is, the, the tradition of aesthetic discourse, no matter what the announced intention has been at different points, has always consistently and systematically returned to prioritizing the question of the specificity of art. So when Baumgarten, the, the original framer of the, the term aesthesis, uh, when he introduces aesthesis in the 18th century, he's proposing a, a, a study of the way in which we know the world through, through the senses. He's not proposing a discourse on art, but aesthetics in the post-Kantian tradition becomes always a discussion primarily it returns again and again to the idea that the artwork is the privileged space within which we can think about what it is to have a thesis, what it is to do the world. And I think that both Bourdieu and Ranciere fail to, to really interrogate this. So coming to Ranciere, I think his historical model, and I think it's not, it does, it's not a get, you're not able to get out of this problem by saying, well, he's proposing it as an analytic principle and not primarily or exclusively as a historical thing. I think there is an obligation to historicize here. And I think Rancière inadequately historicizes. He does not reckon with the way in which the work of aesthetic theory has operated within the philosophical tradition of modernity to always privilege the, the question of the artwork. Um, and high cultural forms as the definitive forms of aesthetic action, experience, and reflection. So by not historicizing, particularly his proposed transition from the regime of representation to the regime of the aesthetic, by not properly historicizing that, I think he introduces these problems that Kester is seizing upon in his work. And I just finish with this um, uh, with this line, this is going back, so Baumgart, in the development of philosophical aesthetics as a, as a formally constituted discrete uh, body of discourse within the tradition of modern philosophy, the trajectory, one of the trajectories is from Leibniz into Baumgarten into Kant. Uh, and, and Kant takes Baumgarten's use of the word aesthetics and, and deploys it. And Baumgarten was attempting to work with this idea that, that Leibniz had deployed earlier. And, and the reason I'm going back to this Leibniz is because I think you can hear an echo, uh, a, pre, a, pre, a preliminary, uh, a pre-echo, or a for, uh, what is it? What happens before? <laughs> you, can, you, yeah, you can hear a preceding, uh, a foreshadowing of Ranciere's lexicon. Uh, Leibniz's use of the phrase, je ne sais quoi which was a commonplace in the discussions of taste in the 17th century, is of special interest here. The, refer the phrase refers to the apprehension of qualities which are clearly perceived, although we cannot account for them adequately, nor express our perception of them distinctly, i.e. by means of concepts. The phrase je ne sais quoi was invoked in order to suggest a gap between what can be felt and what can be formulated in words. And I think we have here this sayable and a, 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 a prefiguring of this lexicon. Um, and so I in summary, I, I would say I, I continue to recognize a huge value within the work of Ranciere. I think there is a problem with the way in which he does not properly historicize the development of aesthetic discourse and he does not properly historicize his model of the regime of representation trans uh, changing to the regime of the aesthetic. Um, and I think that, that the, the way forward here in terms of uh, how, do we, how do we maneuver is to introduce a corrective that Kester proposes. And, and what Kester proposes is that rather than getting into the routinized application of unexamined theoretical tropes, uh, that we begin our investigations from an open and searching investigation of the specific conditions of a practice that operates across the boundaries of the different, these different analytics and these, di these different discursive frames. What that would mean 
is that instead of Bishop's listing of these works at the beginning of her article, Santiago Sierra does this, Jeremy Dalla does that, instead of that listing, which, which Ron Sierra also does, that we would have much more of a close scrutiny, not just of the text and context. That l l if, you, if you remember the way Ron Sierra does the film he in Vanda's room, he gives us this close-up view of a moment in the film, and then he gives this generic thing about how it might circulate in film festivals. But it, it, it would be different if he started to attend to the specific critical reception of a screening of the work within a particular context. Like what happens, say, if the work is screened within a suburb of Lisbon? Or what happens if the work is screened within a particular context and a particular discourse that emerges around it? And I think the, the, the essentially what I, my, my, my reservation with Monsieur is the degree to which he is still caught within the traditions of European high culture. And I see this as something that is very characteristic of the French philosophical tradition, which is a, a kind of an overvaluing of the idea of art and, and an in, not, not re, he, I think we need the dialectic of Rancière and Bourdieu. We need, we need both moments to get to something else, but I'll leave that.